Hello everyone, Seraphin here. Welcome back for my new player's guide to Fire Emblem Heroes. Today we're finally going to do some proper gameplay. I know it's been a little while, I apologize for going through everything else first, but I honestly think it's important to set a good foundation before we get really rolling into the game. So, today we're going to jump right into it. This is the battle menu, this is where all the gameplay happens. As you can see, there's several different options on this screen, but they're all faded out except for the story maps. So we have to go there first. Also, if you're curious, this little red stamp right here means that there's new things to do here. So we're going to jump right into the story first, and we're actually going to play through the main story. And there's actually several different options under the main story here. We have main story itself, we have paralogues, which are like little side quests. Tactics drills are like uh, puzzles that you can solve, which are kind of fun. Uh, heroic ordeals, these are for obtaining dragon flowers. we'll talk about that later. And then finally we have multi-map battles, these are several different maps in sequence that are very, very challenging. That's kind of like endgame content for the most part. So we'll talk about that later. First things first, though, we're going to go straight into the main story. And we see we have Book 1, the prologue, which is World of Zenith. That is the continent, so to speak, that this game takes place on for the most part, is Zenith. And we can see here, this is Prologue Part 1. The average level of the enemies you'll be fighting is level 2, which is really, really easy. And these are the weapon types on the bottom here of the enemies that we'll be fighting on this map. We see there is a red sword unit, a blue lance, and a green axe. And it costs two stamina for us to start this chapter. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Prince with golden wings. That sounds pretty cool. And we see here our reward for the first clear of this map is an orb. So let's jump right in. And this here is Prince Alphonse. Prince Alphonse is the prince, as you might imagine, of the Kingdom of Asker. He's one of the main characters in the story. I raised Breitablick, whatever that is. It's like the summoning gun that, the, that you as the player technically get to use. Our great hero is here and can use the divine weapon. Yeah, so much for a weapon, I guess. It shoots heroes right out of it. Fantastic. Apparently I'm a great hero come from another realm. That's pretty cool. Yes, Alphonse, Prince of Asker, member of the Order of Heroes. The Order of Heroes are basically a group dedicated to, you know... I mean, I'm not sure how, I'm not even sure how to explain exactly what they do. I guess we'll let Alphonse explain. I have need of your help, Prince Alphonse says. So we're, uh, ver we are engaged in combat against the Emblian Empire. They invade worlds that heroes come from. One of these is the world of mystery, meaning the world of Arcanea. So that's Fire Emblem 1, 3, 11, and 12, if you were curious. We need to make our way to the world of mystery to free it. Alright, sounds cool. A strange man, not an Imperial soldier, nor a hero from the world of mystery. I wonder who that could be. He wears a mask and keeps his face a secret. Eh, that's fantastic. Gotta love mysterious characters in Fire Emblem. There's never, you know, never been any of those before. Alright, so here we are. Keep the weapon triangle in mind. So Alphonse is telling us to keep the weapon triangle in mind. And that can be seen down here in the bottom right. So, what is weapon triangle? This is a staple of the Fire Emblem series. And it has been preserved in Heroes, obviously, because it seems kind of dumb to take it out. So what we have here is red weapons are strong against green, and so on and so forth. So red beats green. Green beats blue, blue beats red. It's literally rock, paper, scissors. It's that simple. And that applies to any color, any any weapon, rather, of that color. So green uh, green bow beats a blue lance, a blue lance beats a red dagger, so on and so forth. Just worry about the color. That's the important thing. Uh, if a unit is colorless, like an archer, for example, like Takumi, uh, they do not, they're not affected by the triangle at all. And what does the triangle do exactly? Well, it basically means... When you are engaged in a battle against a unit with which you have an advantage against on the weapon triangle, you will do 20%, or your attack, rather, is a, is increased by 20% against them, and their attack is decreased by 20% against you. So you hit them harder, and they don't hit you as hard. So it's very nice if you can have the advantage on triangle. So we're going to go ahead and park Anna up here to meet with that blue lance guy. And these two guys are, let's see, we're going to have Ray move over toward the green one. And the red one we can deal with with whoever, really. So we're just going to have Takumi and Matthew go that way. 
So as you see there, that simple movement is them moving up, moving basically up and then left with this axe guy you saw there. If I had, um, what is it, not simple, but if I had, uh, yeah, if it's, I had simple turned on instead of guided, they would just pop right over to the spot they were going to move to instead of slowly doing it one square at a time. And as you can see here on the bottom, we have the danger area enabled. That is what this uh, purple reddish border is. This is the attack ranges of all of the different enemy units on the board. We can toggle that on or off if we want. I like to keep it on just in case, but your mileage may vary. Uh, obviously, we have an end turn button on the bottom here. We have auto battle. This means the AI will take control of our units for us and fight for us without us having to do anything. I don't recommend that, only because the AI, the AI is really dumb in terms of your units. The AI is not too bad on the enemy side, but on your side, I guess they can play by completely different rules and you just get killed a lot. Don't use that unless you really need to. We can go to the menu from here. We can do auto battle from here as well. We can get to the settings menu. We can surrender the map and quit. Or we can use something called a Light's Blessing. Now, if you have a Light's Blessing in your inventory, which uh, I don't actually have any. If you don't have any, you can spend orbs to do it, but I don't recommend this. Well, what does a Light's Blessing do? That will immediately revive all your units on the board if they were killed. It'll restore them all to full HP, and it will immediately charge their specials, which is really, really awesome. But Light's Blessings are very few and far between. They're really hard to get, and there's actually not that many game modes you can use them in, apart from, like, the story or anything. You can't use them in Arena. You can't use them in Aether Raids. You can't use them in a lot of special maps. It's really just for the story. There's not many other things you can even use them in, so... If you need to use them just to get through a hard map, go for it, but, you know, don't just hoard them all, but I also wouldn't recommend using them unless you really need to. So, you can see here when I click on Anna, we've got the blue squares. That is her movement range. I can have her move to any of the blue squares. And then the red squares are her attack range. And you can see the ones that are lit up a little brighter in the enemies, that means she can go hit them. And because Anna is an infantry unit, she has a movement range of two squares. We're going to go ahead and move her up one and attack this Lance soldier. And we can actually see a battle forecast on top here when I hover over the guy. So I will hit him for 20 damage twice because I am faster than him and I double hit him. And he'll hit me once for one if he had a chance to counter attack. But because I kill him in one hit, he won't get a chance to do that. So we can see here that at the end of the battle, Anna will still have 20 HP and the guy will have zero and will be defeated. And we can see here from the little arrows, I have a triangle advantage against him. He has a triangle disadvantage. So we're going to go ahead and engage the fight. And Anna just cleans his clock in a single hit, and she gets experience points. And there she's even faster and got some resistance as well. And we got skill points, which is good. We need skill points for learning skills. Uh, in addition to getting skill points when you level up, I, it's, an, it's, it's not exactly a fixed number, but if you level from 1 to 40, you'll end up with a fixed number of experience, or your skill points, rather. But whenever you defeat an enemy... At long, as long as they're within your level range, with plus or minus, I think it's like six or seven levels, you will gain three skill points per kill. I think after you, after you're like out leveling enemies by a significant margin, you will no longer gain skill points from them. So, if you want to gain skill points, I think it's got to be at least within six levels of them for you to gain anything, which is fine because that's not that big of a deal. But anyway, so Ray is a magic unit, and he actually has a range of two with his weapon instead of one. This means that he cannot retaliate at, cl at close range when he's attacked by a melee unit, but he can also attack guys from two squares away that can't retaliate against him. So we're going to move Ray right here, and then I can launch an attack from a distance against this Axe Fighter. And you can see here I do exactly enough damage to kill him, and he cannot counter me. Even if I, even if I didn't kill him one hit, he can't because his weapon only has one range. We're going to go ahead and take him down. Launch a giant wolf head at his face. Uh, the Router Wolf, by the way, is effective against Cavalry, so if there were mounted units in this map, Ray would be especially good against them. Whenever you have effectiveness against something, so we see here that Ray is effective against Cavalry, that just means that his total attack value is multiplied by one and a half times. So instead of 15, he would actually have 22 attack against a Cavalry unit, which is pretty nice, because it multiplies that first and then compares it against their resistance stat. And we see that uh, Ray also has an assist skill. He has Rally Attack. That means whenever he chooses to activate his assist skill, meaning he moves next to an ally and rallies them, and he will grant them attack plus four for one turn. 
And I'll actually do that next time so you can see it, but it, it shows up a little differently. But uh, Matthew has something called Reciprocal Aid, which is really cool. It allows him to swap his HP with some other with another ally, but neither can go above or below their max. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and have Takumi take this guy off from distance, because again, he does it in one shot. So I'm an archer, I have distance on him, he can't retaliate, we'll just pot shot him from distance. Goodbye. And that is chapter one of the paralog or the not the paralog the prologue done. And Takumi gets a level up, which is cool. Now that little those numbers that popped up at the end there, those little white numbers that were like fractional numbers, that was hero merit. And whenever units complete a map successfully, the, the surviving ones will gain hero merit. And we'll talk about that in a little while when it's relevant, because we'll, it might level up at some point. And we got a Hero Path quest completed. We complete Prologue Part 1. This is that masked guy that Alphonse are talking about, I presume. This must be the masked man you saw, Anna says. Yeah, it's almost like it's exactly what I just said. Apparently the Emblean Empire is evil. Huh. In your dreams, he says. Get back here and answer for yourself. It's funny they just let him walk away. Instead of, you know, fighting him. These gateways, they connect our world to all those where heroes live. So, the nobility of the Askarin kingdom has the ability to... Oh, she says it right here. Uh, the nobility of Asker can open these gateways to other worlds, and the nobility from Embla gets to close them. But instead of Embla closing them, they're just invading them and conquering them and taking the people over there. Apparently they used to work in harmony, but now Embla is just being a bunch of jerks and leaving the gates open and exploiting them for power. Kind of a bummer. So the whole function of the Order of Heroes, which Anna is the commander-in-chief of, is to stop the Emblians, and she basically is in charge of all the heroes that get recruited from these various worlds, or the ones that the Summoner sends to the world from his divine quote-unquote weapon. Now we're going to run to the World of Mystery, and Alphonse's sister apparently has been on a scouting mission there, and she might be in trouble, so we're going to go there. You see we get a free orb. Uh, we also got a kill with Anna, which was one of our March quests, so we get an orb for that. And if we had a Fae Pass subscription, we would have gotten three orbs from KOing a foe. But because I don't have that, I can't claim these three. What's really annoying is that it'll show you the Fae Pass quests you completed, even if you're not a subscriber, but you can't claim them unless you pay for it. It's really annoying. I don't know why they bother doing that, but there's already been a lot of outrage about that on the subreddit. And then we see here, these we've also made progress towards completing other quests. And this will give us a little bit of a breakdown of what we made progress towards. Which is kind of nice. We're going to go ahead and close that. And now we can pop into Prologue Part 2. And again, we see that there is a sword, a lance, an axe, and a staff user on this map. It is level 2 and costs 2 stamina to start. You'll notice that there's a check mark here because I completed the chapter. And if I restart it, I don't get orbs again, obviously. That'd be a little bit ridiculous. But I have the option to skip the... the uh, Chapter dialogue if I play it, if I decide to play it again. So we're going to go ahead and go to chapter 2. We'll get another free orb for completing it if we do. Okay, and you'll note that when someone says something like that when you initiate a map, it's just one of your teammates that's just saying like a battle initiation quote, pretty much. So this is Sharena. Sharena's awesome. I like her quite a bit. She is the princess of Asker, so she's Alphonse's sister. And she, if you might can't tell from her weapon, she is a lance unit, and she's also one of the main characters of the game. It's all a glow. Please calm yourself. Apparently, I'm also a talented technician. In, in addition to being in like a divine hero or whatever, great hero. Yeah, sorry. He's going to be my number one fan. Isn't that just the best? Alphonse's darling little sister. Yeah, huh? Situation here is apparently dreadful. The Empire's taking control of a hero from the world of mystery. Oh, boy. He swoops through the sky as a fearsome figure all in red. That's probably Minerva. 
Yep, that would be Minerva. Minerva's actually amazing. Battle will be tough. We should bring in a hero who's an archer. Well, I'm glad I prepared for that. This is Minerva. Minerva's amazing. She is a playable character from Fire Emblem 1 and 3, as well as 11 and 12, technically, the remakes. Uh, she is super duper cool. She's a wyvern rider, and she's awesome. I tried to get her for a very long time when this game first came out. I successfully did, finally, but it took me a really, really long time. She's the Princess of Macedon. She is bound to serve the Emblean Empire and the Imperial Princess Veronica. Uh-oh. So what's going on is the Emblean Empire, led by the Princess Veronica, just invades these worlds and, like, ben uh, bends all the inhabitants to their will. The only way to break them of this having to serve them is to defeat them in battle. Which seems kind of weird, I know, but... I'm under contract to obey Princess Veronica. There's only one way to release me. Prove you are stronger. You must fight and win! So that's the whole premise of this game. Is that you're continu- Oh uh, yes, so Alphonse is telling us we can, we can destroy walls. Attack a crumbling wall, destroy it. This is also a common staple in the game of Fire Emblem in general. These walls right here, because they're crumbling and in crappy shape, we can break them. And I, generally speaking, it only costs one attack to break them. Doesn't matter how much damage you do. And some of them take two hits to break, though, so be careful of that. And it'll tell you when you go to attack them. For example, we'll have Matthew try to attack a wall here. You see the obstacle has one hit point, and if we break it, it'll do one damage to it, and it's just going to be gone. So we'll have Matthew break that wall. And now we can pass through it. And I'll have Ray move up and attack this wall also. And now we can move Anna and Takumi through the opening. And you can see here we've got a few opponents. Ah yes, flyers are weak to arrows. This is another staple of Fire Emblem. Anything with wings on it, if you shoot it with arrows, it uh, will take a lot of extra damage. So we have Paula and Katria, as well as Princess Minerva here. They're all flyers. We also have Minerva's little sister, Maria. She's a healer. All she can do, as you can see here, is heal. She restores five hit points when she does that. She has no weapon equipped, no special, no passive skills, just a heal staff, and her stats are garbage. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and let Katria come to us. Not that I'm particularly afraid of her or anything, but yes. there's a reason to get ourselves cluttered up in here. We'll go ahead and put Anna in the front, and I will wait for them to come to me. I'm just going to end my turn. Katria and Pala are moving up. So we're going to have Takumi move up right here and take a shot at Pala. Now, the way that you can tell that you're effective against them, when you're looking at the damage numbers on the battle forecast, you see the numbers in green. This means that your weapon is effective against that enemy. So Takumi normally wouldn't do that much. We see he has an attack of 18, and Pala has one defense. So normally this attack would only do 17, but because my weapon is good against hers, or her movement type, I do one and a half times the extra damage. So 26 instead of 17. And that's going to go ahead and obliterate Pala in one shot. And of course we get a level up for that. You won't always get level up from killing somebody. It depends on how much higher or lower level they are than you. And we're going to go ahead and take out Katria here. I'm actually going to move up Ray and attack Katria with Matthew. You can see an effect that he's got here. So we're going to attack Catcher with Matthew. He only does 8 damage to her because she's actually a little bulky, but that's okay. Because dagger units in this game, you see that there was a flash of light that came off of Matthew and on Catria. And if we look at Matthew's sprite on the map, he's got a little green arrow right here. This means he's been buffed. This means that he's got some stat increases from a, some ability that he's got. And if we look at his stat screen, we can see that his defense and his resistance are in blue. This means that they have been buffed or increased temporarily. And if we click on him, we can get a breakdown of that. We see here the base value is 5, and he has a buff of 3. So the total is now 8. And the reason he's getting that buff to his defense and resistance is because of his weapon, his dagger. After combat, if he attacked, we inflict defense and resistance minus 3 on the foe through its next action, and grants unit, namely Matthew... Defense and Resistance plus 3 for one turn. So if you look at Matthew, he's got plus 3 to Defense and Resistance. And if you look at Katria, she has a red arrow, or orange arrow, down on her picture. It means she's been debuffed. 
or penalized. And her defense and resistance, normally it would be two, but now it's zero, because it's debuffed by three. Same with her resistance, would have been two, but now it's down to zero, because she's been debuffed. And that only that debuff only lasts until the next time she acts, either moves or attacks or anything like that. And Matthew's buff only lasts until the beginning of his next turn. So these are temporary buffs, but these are visible buffs and debuffs, or uh, increases in penalties. So as a result of Matthew, almost every dagger, by the way, does this. Almost every dagger in the game uh, will inflict defense and resistance penalties on whoever you attack them with. So now we actually can't move Katri in range to finish off, or we can't move Anna in range to finish off Katri, but that's okay. Move up a little bit and we'll finish the map next turn. So Maria comes over and heals up Katria. And Katria goes for Ray because he can't retaliate. And here comes Minerva. So what we're going to do is I think we're just going to have Ray move down and he can't finish up Maria because Maria's actually got decent resistance because she's a healer. A lot of times healers will have really good resistance, but not so much in the defense area. Uh, we're actually going to have Anna come over here and take out Maria real quick. Always try to take out enemy healers if you can because they just make your life really annoying. We'll have Takumi finish off Minerva because of the effectiveness against flying foes. As you can see, uh, every time, or both times, uh, Takumi fired an arrow at somebody, his special counter, the little purple number by his head here, is ticking down. It started at 3, because that's the base value of his special skill retribution, but now that he's fired twice, it's ticked down to 1. Every time a unit attacks or is attacked, their special counter goes down 1, as a general rule. And then when it's ready to go, it'll be, it'll just have that little purple symbol right here instead of a number. And the next time he attacks, he'll boost his damage by 30% of how much damage has been dealt to him. So it wouldn't be a very big number, but it's something. And we're going to go ahead and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Ray and I'm going to target Matthew with a rally. So this, what, this, what this is going to do is rally attack that Ray has access to. And all this will do is provide a temporary buff of four attack to Matthew. And we're going to go and execute that. Now, if we look at Matthew, he has 14 attack instead of 10 because he's been rallied by Ray. Now I should be able to finish off Katri with that. Yep, just enough damage. So I normally would have done 8 before, but now I do 12 because of the bonus. And that will finish off Katria. So those assist skills that every unit can have potentially, potentially have access to are also very nice to have. It does cost your unit their movement or their action to use an assist skill. But sometimes assist skills are very, very beneficial and you, it, would not, it does not behoove you to not use them. And that is that map cleared up. And now the contract that Minerva had with Veronica has been broken. We are free and we will not attack you. Bye. Emily and soldiers are advancing on our kingdom. Well, that's not good. It was a distraction. No, we must go. If, you, if, if your whole army is our guys, then we got a problem. Back to Asker. We get an orb for completing the chapter. Made some quest progress. Let's go ahead and jump into part three of the prologue. I think this is the last one. I'm not sure, but we'll find out. We'll finish this up real quick. This is Princess Veronica of the Emblian Empire. She's technically evil. I think she's more just childish and naive than evil, after having encountered her character a number of times, but we'll see how it goes. She's also like, like thirteen or fourteen or something. She's not very, she's not very old. Oh, it's you. She's actually a very powerful mage. She doesn't probably doesn't look like it, but she's incredibly powerful. Talking to me, by the way. You must be the legendary summoner. You must be the first to die. Oh, Xander. Uh oh. So Xander is from Fire Emblem Fates, and he's actually really, really freaking powerful in that game. And she's apparently ensnared Xander to the point where he is, like, gonna do whatever he needs to do for her. 
One of the most powerful heroes in the world of Conquest, yep. Xander's actually really scary in, in uh, Bates, but in this one not so much because all he has is a basic iron sword. He does have an assist skill called Reposition, which is probably the best one. This lets someone swap sides of it. Like, you move it next to someone and you click on them and it moves them to the other side of the unit that used it. It's really, really nice. You see here they have a Rally Defense on this guy, they have a Healer, and they have an Archer. So we're going to go ahead and bring up our Archer first to counter theirs. Let's go. Onward. There's actually really cool music in the background This playing in this level. I just like this one a lot. Now the enemy's moving up. They're going to rally the defense of that archer and take a shot at us. And if he hadn't rallied defense, I would have killed him in one shot, but because he did, now I can't finish him in, one, in a single hit. There, Xander just repositioned that archer to get him out of the way. Now the healer can heal him. Nice team synergy there. To use a unit's assist skill, move the unit onto another one. Yes, I believe I already explained that, Alphonse, but thank you. So we're actually going to move up Matthew here and reduce Xander's defense with our Rogue Dagger. We see Matthew attacks him twice, because Xander's actually really freaking slow in this game. And now Xander's defense has been debuffed to a whopping one. And that should allow any of our guys to walk up here and take him out in a single hit. Sadly, I don't have any movement assist skills, because I would like Ray to finish him off. And actually, here's something neat. If you look, hover over Ray and click on him here, there's these green check marks that appear over Xander and over that mounted healer. That is telling us that his weapon is effective against them because he has something that's good against cavalry. If he, if there were instead a red exclamation mark over any enemy units, that means that he is in danger of being uh, super being attacked against effectively by them. But because he's infantry, and I don't think anything in the game is affected by infantry that badly. I guess there's one thing, but we're not. There's nothing. There's nothing to worry about here. So we're just gonna park Ray up here. I'm actually going to get Takumi out of the way, and we're going to move Ray up instead. Just because I want him to have a kill. I think I feel like he deserves it. And Xander will most likely go for Matthew, because Matthew will not be able to counter him. Yep. Thankfully, Matthew's actually pretty tanky for a thief and takes no damage. And this archer goes for Anna, but again, no damage. We're going to move Ray up to here and have him take out Xander in a single shot because of his effectiveness from his wolf tome. Goodbye, Xander. And then we're going to have Matthew finish off the healer because we don't like healers. They're annoying. Now that's going to buff up Matthew's defense and resistance, but I don't think he particularly needs it, to be completely honest with you. And then we'll have Archer versus Archer, because Takumi is just straight up better. Takumi is actually pretty good. I like using him quite a bit. When the game first came out, he was one of the best units in the game, actually. And it was funny, because you'd go into the arena and you'd see teams of people just had four Takumis and nothing else. And he just he would absolutely wreck. It's, it was absurd back in the day, but sadly, he's not quite as good as he used to be anymore. Which is unfortunate. Feels like he's seen some better days. He's been power crept. Power creep is definitely a thing in this game. Much to a very high extent, unfortunately, too. It seems like units from the first generation, the first year of the game, are just can't compete with units that are being newly released nowadays. Very unfortunate, but that's just how a lot of games like this go. That is stage three of the prologue clear, and I think that's the entire prologue. She's gonna run all home and have some tea, I guess. The Empire will invade again soon enough. Yeah, go figure. Such a brat. Even though this is the prince and princess, they're still a member of the Order of Heroes and therefore still technically under Anna's command, which is kind of interesting. Alright, so that is the prologue taken care of. Now it says a new chapter has been added to the main story. Uh, we can now access the paralogues. We can now access the tactics drills. And we can now access special maps, the Colosseum, and more. And the training tower. And here's some quest progress that we got completed. So now we can see here we can access chapter 1. 
And if you notice up top here, there's actually more than one book. This means there's more than one, like, story segment. So there's a book one, there's book two, there is book three, and finally there is book four. So book four is the one that's currently ongoing. This came out fairly recently, I think last year, like late last year. But I recommend you go through and play these one or in order, obviously. Not only do you get a better sense of the story, but you'll unlock things in a, in a more sensical order. But every single one of these chapters, uh, these main story chapters, there is, for every chapter, there is five parts. And there's actually three different difficulties. So we have chapter one, part one on normal difficulty, but there's also hard difficulty and lunatic difficulty. And you can see lunatic is level requires level 21, not requires, but that's the average level of the enemy. So play through the game on normal first, get your guys leveled up. Get them however you like, and then go through and do hard mode, and then go through and do lunatic mode. Every single chapter, every part, gives you an orb for completing, and that's on every difficulty. So, on normal, there's five parts, that's five orbs. Hard mode is five more orbs, and then lunatic is five more. And there's a lot of content to go through in the game right now, so you as a new player will actually get an absolute buttload of free orbs just from doing story content right now. And it's definitely a good time to be a new player right now. So that's the main story. We will talk about all the other fun stuff that you can do in the next episode. This one's running a little long. So join me next time. We'll go through more of the different battle maps that are available and what all they mean and all that fun stuff. So until then, please feel free to like the channel and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment if you have any questions. I will do my best to answer them. And otherwise, I will see you next time. So until then, this has been Seraphin. Stay classy, internets.